today we're very happy to be finishing up our um, arithmetic statistics series for the summer. And the last talk in that series is by Robert Lemke Oliver, speaking about upper bounds for number fields. And uh, Robert, is it all right if we video this talk? Absolutely is. Great, uh, please go ahead. All right. So thank you very much uh, for sort of the invitation to speak here. And uh, thanks sort of to all of you uh, for tuning in uh, kind of to yet another sort of online talk, uh, but hopefully we'll kind of have some fun with this. So I'll be sort of like kind of live writing sort of my notes here, and I think sort of uh, they'll be posted uh, after the fact. Uh, but kind of one of the advantages of doing that is it sort of allows me sort of as a speaker to be a little bit kind of more interactive uh, and kind of to adapt on the fly, sort of depending on whether there are questions. So in particular, if you have questions, please feel free to post them in the chat. I've got that kind of uh, off of my screen. Uh, and also please feel free, of course, uh, to unmute and ask, and I'll also try to do my best of remembering to pause periodically uh, to allow for questions to, react, to be asked in that way. Uh, so for me, so this is a talk on upper bounds and number fields, uh, joint with a number of people that'll kind of uh, explain uh, in a little bit sort of as sort of the appropriate time comes. Uh, but the sort of main uh, question I'm sort of interested in in this talk uh, originates with a theorem uh, due to uh, sort of Meet and Minkowski. And I think sort of this was also kind of an important uh, theorem and kind of thread in Ilo Varma's talk. Uh, they will be going in kind of a little bit of a different direction uh, with it, uh, with the question. So in particular, uh, what sort of the Ermit or Minkowski theorem says is that for any uh, sort of x greater than or equal to one, uh, there are only uh, finitely many uh, number fields k over q uh, with uh, absolute discriminant of k at most x. So this is sort of a wonderful kind of finiteness result. So again, sort of says that kind of amongst sort of the entire C of number fields, only finitely many uh, have discriminant bounded by x. And the main question I sort of want to ask sort of in this talk or want to be considering uh, is just what is this number? Right, this is some sort of finite number. So what is it? Okay. And in particular, uh, if we call it, say, n of x, because it's going to depend on this parameter x, uh, we might sort of ask, sort of how does this sort of grow? How does n of x grow as x goes to infinity? And so this is a kind of, uh, I think, widely sort of open problem. Okay? Uh, but uh, sort of, I think, if we're sort of forced kind of to speculate on sort of an answer, I don't think anybody has conjectured sort of an answer to precisely this problem. I think, uh, I don't think anybody would really sort of feel comfortable sort of making a precise conjecture toward this problem. Uh, but I think it's sort of reasonable to speculate, perhaps somewhat provocatively, right, that maybe uh, there exists some constant C uh, greater than zero, such that uh, N of X grows like some constant times X. But again, I should kind of emphasize this is certainly not even at the level of a conjecture. Okay, so we don't understand this function. Uh, and again, we don't even necessarily know how to think about this function. But nevertheless, we know it exists. We can sort of ask what we can affirmatively say about it. Okay. And so the way that the Aramit Minkowski theorem is proved uh, is it kind of uses. Uh, Kind of proceeds in two parts, which is why there are kind of two names attached to this. Okay. And the first part uh, is due to Minkowski. Okay. Uh, who will sort of give sort of the version of the theorem I'm going to state, uh, but there are also substantial improvements uh, due to many people uh, and kind of to include a couple of names, we'll list sort of Stark uh, and Litchko. Okay. Uh, but what it says, is there is a constant C C again greater than one, uh, such that 
uh, the discriminant of any number field, sort of K, is at least uh, C to the degree of K over Q. Okay, and so sort of Minkowski is the first person to prove that there is such a constant. Okay. Uh, again, sort of then the problem of kind of determining which constants sort of are admissible has sort of received much attention. And uh, I think the best bounds are due to uh, Andrew Aguisco. And I think sort of roughly the form, maybe like C is about like 20, okay, at least sort of for large degree number of fields. Okay. But what's sort of the point of this? Okay. Well, the upshot of this is that we can actually kind of decompose this function n of x that we're trying to understand uh, and by sort of the degree of the appropriate number of fields. Okay. So in particular, uh, if, uh, maybe I'll sort of say, if we define, say, n sub n of x uh, to be the number of number fields, k over q, with degree n and discriminant up to x, okay. uh, then we can kind of decompose this function n of x as a sum of all of these functions n n of x. And a priori, before Minkowski's work, it could have need to add up over all possible degrees ever. But at least it sort of lets us kind of curtail that a little bit. And in particular, uh, I can kind of decompose this uh, for degrees that are less than some constant times log x. So this gives us some way of kind of decomposing uh, this function n of x. And so this sort of then kind of the next question is uh, how does n n of x behave uh, as x goes to infinity. And in sort of a very real sense, uh, our best progress towards understanding the full function n of x really does kind of like pass through this kind of like fibering sort of based on degrees of the fields. And so it's going to be this function n n of x, it's going to be kind of really sort of the main actor uh, of this talk. And so in particular, uh, I've sort of written its sort of definition kind of behind me on this board, if you happen to kind of to be able to sort of uh, maximize sort of uh, my picture, you kind of want to be reminded of its definition. But again, it's just sort of the number of degree n extensions of Q uh, with discriminant bounded by X. Okay. And again, the question then is how does this behave as X goes to infinity? And here at least there is, is I think, a firm conjecture. Okay. Uh, maybe I'll attribute this uh, to Linux. Uh, I think sort of the usual phrase uh, is it's sort of a folk conjecture often attributed to Linux uh, that there exists a constant Cn greater than zero uh, such that uh, Nn of x is asymptotic to Cn times x as x goes to infinity. And so there are kind of firm predictions for this constant Cn if we kind of put some sort of restrictions on our fields, uh, sort of K that we're looking at. Okay. Uh, in particular, if we sort of say we want to look only at degree n sort of extensions K over Q, whose sort of Galois closure has Galois group Sn, then there are kind of firm for predictions for this. And I think kind of the technology exists to write down an explicit sort of uh, constant Cn that I think sort of everyone would believe, but I don't think anyone has actually sort of done this. Okay. Um, but in particular, we kind of believe that sort of the number of degree n extensions with discriminant bounded by x should always grow like some constant uh, times x. But this is very much still a conjecture. And in particular, it's known uh, only in degrees n up to five. And so kind of the breakdown here, n equals two, the sort of classical it's sort of essentially amounts of counting square free numbers. Uh, N equals three is the Davenport Heilbronn theorem. Uh, N equals four, and it actually ends up sort of breaking up into kind of uh, two subcases. Okay. Uh, and sort of one of the subcases uh, ends up being solved uh, by work of Module Bargaba, the other being solved in work of Cohen 
Diaz, Diaz, and Olivier. And I think sort of there was quite a bit about sort of degree four extensions covered in Elon Armour's talks. So again, I'm not going to be kind of focusing on precisely sort of this story right, for most of this talk. Okay. Uh, and sort of for n equals five, uh, again, this is a theorem of Bardava. Okay. And these are sort of the only cases in which this is known. And so really sort of then the question sort of I'm going to be kind of asking about here is in the face of the fact that we sort of don't really understand this set uh, for uh, degrees sort of six and above, what are we able to say about it? So any questions so far before I kind of dive into kind of what we can say about this sort of function from a, sort of an approximate lens? Great. So there's a question kind of what are the CN like for n equals two, three, four, five? So uh, CNs for, I'll say kind of n prime, okay? then essentially sort of what we kind of expect if n is a prime number, which kind of conveniently covers two, three, and five, uh, it's kind of a little bit misleading that kind of, kind of seems like kind of four is like a little bit of a weird case. Really, it's just kind of what we should expect to have happen for any composite degree. Uh, these are kind of dictated uh, by sort of products uh, over primes, over all primes P of certain sort of like local uh, mass formulae. So in particular, you do something sort of very much like uh, count sort of all uh, atoll extensions of QP of degree N, kind of give each of them some sort of weight, you kind of multiply sort of all of those uh, kind of possible sort of uh, masses sort of together uh, to get this. And so in particular, kind of these formulas are always given uh, by infinite products uh, sort of in kind of prime degrees. And what's happening sort of in composite degrees, or maybe sort of the distinction uh, between sort of composite degrees and prime degrees is that in prime degrees, we expect only sort of SN extensions uh, to contribute kind of to our main term. Uh, we kind of expect kind of 100% of degree N uh, fields when N is prime to be uh, SN. And when you have N composite, then you actually have lots of other ways of kind of building these things up, more or less corresponding to taking sort of an SD extension of some sort of subfield uh, of degree N over D. Okay. And so composite degrees sort of see this sort of kind of phenomenon, uh, but also uh, terms sort of only given uh, as infinite sums uh, over sort of subfields. Maybe I should say here possible subfields. So in particular, uh, in the case of sort of uh, n equals four, sort of Barkov is sort of handled kind of the S4 sort of case. And the other case was sort of handled by Cohen, Diaz, Diaz, and Olivier. And this roughly speaking corresponds to quartic extensions that could be de decomposed as a quadratic extension of a quadratic field. And so then you get some sort of complicated sum corresponding to what quadratic field might be sort of in the middle uh, of that kind of tower. There are lots of sort of other sort of ways you can write that down uh, for other degrees. And again, sort of I think if you're careful with this, uh, it should be possible to come up with some prediction for what the general constant CN uh, should be in this conjecture. Great. Other questions? I'm not seeing anything, so I'm gonna kind of proceed. Uh, so again, this talk is about upper bounds on number fields. And I think sort of the first time you kind of see the fact that this is a hard problem, it's sort of amazing uh, that it's kind of opened kind of even for degree six, uh, given that there's kind of a pretty natural approach uh, to this problem, namely that uh, we get number fields by writing sort of, uh, sort of associated to any irreducible polynomial. It's sort of easy to write down polynomials. Why isn't it sort of easy uh, to count number fields? And the theorem I'm going to sort of present next, and I'll kind of sketch a proof of this because it's one, I think, a proof uh, that I sort of love, uh, but also I think it kind of addresses uh, sort of essentially kind of the natural sort of uh, question of why this is a difficult problem uh, is due to Schmidt. But I actually think of this as being kind of a very much an optimized version of Hermit's original argument. 
And what it says uh, is that uh, the sort of function nn of x is no bigger uh, than x uh, to the n plus two over four. And so strictly speaking, if you kind of want to care about my question one that I sort of introduced at the very beginning of this talk, how many number fields are there of discriminant bounded by x, uh, regardless of degree, you should care about kind of the uniformity of this result with respect to the degree n. And if this is a, a question that interests you, I'm happy to talk, talk to you about this after the talk. Uh, but for right now, kind of for the purposes of having uh, a little bit more of a streamlined presentation, I'm not going to kind of neglect sort of to keep track of that uh, sort of dependence. Okay. And so what's sort of the idea of Schmidt's proof? Okay. Well, the idea is that sort of any number field, K over Q of degree N is cut out uh, by a polynomial of degree N, okay? And you just wanna pay attention to how complicated uh, a polynomial we're sort of allowed to get if we know that our kind of discriminant is bounded by X. And in particular, if we can kind of put uh, some sort of uh, limits to how complicated, say in terms of the size of its coefficients, a polynomial might be uh, that cuts out this field of discriminant bounded by X, then we'll be able to understand uh, at least sort of approximately how many uh, number fields there are of discriminant bounded by X. Okay. And so kind of to make this uh, approach work, uh, what I, another thing I kind of like about it is that it actually uses very much sort of the definition of the discriminant. Okay. So the discriminant, discriminant of K, is essentially sort of a volume. So in particular, if we kind of embed K sort of under say the Minkowski embedding, Minkowski embedding, where we take K and we embed it using all of kind of its infinite places into the product of R to the R1, plus C to the R2, which I'm just gonna identify with Rn, okay. uh, then sort of the uh, co-volume of the ring of integers of K, okay, which is just sort of the volume of Rn mod OK, sort of mod the lattice OK, uh, is essentially by definition the square root of the discriminant of K, kind of depending on exactly sort of the measures I choose uh, on Minkowski space. And what this sort of then easily implies is that I actually add a restriction uh, to the integers I'm looking at. Okay. This implies also that the co-volume of what I'll kind of denote OK zero, okay, where what this is, uh, this is sort of trace zero integers, sort of elements alpha and OK. Well, then this co-volume of sort of this trace zero uh, subgroup, let's say, sort of a sub lattice uh, of sort of the ring of integers is also gonna have co-volume uh, bounded by, maybe I'll sort of say uh, N sort of times the discriminant of K, just being a little bit conservative here. Uh, essentially because uh, OK0 kind of lives in sort of a hyperplane kind of orthogonal to the embedding of just the vector one. Okay. And so it's relatively straightforward then to go from sort of this to saying that, well, sort of the trace zero uh, ring of integers is kind of has some sort of understandable volume or some understandable co-volume. And then what this then implies is there must exist some alpha in OK zero with uh, sort of height uh, which I'm going to denote by kind of a double bar uh, sort of at most uh, disk K to the one over two N minus two maybe times some sort of small and kind of mild constant. So here kind of what's going on, what is this height? Well, the height 
I want to define as the max of the absolute value of alpha sort of under sort of any embeddings or equivalent kind of the uh, maximum uh, absolute value or Archimedean absolute value of alpha. And why is this true? Well, kind of intuitively, uh, I sort of kind of imagine sort of this sort of lattice OK0 as being some kind of, or this, like the co-volume of this thing is kind of being some sort of uh, n minus one dimensional parallel of pipe bed, or let me kind of cheat a little bit and say n minus one dimensional box. And if I know kind of the volume of a box, then I can kind of say something about the length of the shortest side. And that's going to be sort of the vertex corresponding to that shortest side is exactly going to be this alpha. And this is something that can be made rigorous. So in particular, uh, I get something uh, whose uh, height is a fairly small power of the discriminant, something that's going kind to of decays like one over two n minus two. All right. So then the question is, what does the minimal polynomial of this alpha look like? Minimal polynomial f alpha of x of alpha kind of look like. Well, uh, one thing I can say about it: this is an integral element, so I know uh, I'm going to get a monic sort of polynomial, and I also rigged the games so that alpha is trace zero, so I'm going to get no coefficient of x to the n minus one. And so I'm just going to get some coefficients of x to the n minus two down through uh, sort of, I guess, x to the zero, which I'm going to kind of call a constant term cn. Okay. And the reason I'm indexing things in this way is that kind of ci, uh, sort of the ith term in this, is going to sort of use uh, kind of products of uh, i conjugates of alpha, sort of in defining this, sort of getting to uh, the minimal polynomial. And so in particular, I can say something about the size of CI. And in particular, it's going to be no bigger than x to the i over 2n minus 2. And so in particular here, again, uh, because I'm sort of using sort of i different sort of conjugates to get sort of uh, of alpha to get kind of CI, uh, I'm kind of multiplying those things together. Each one individually is of size at most, well, discriminant to the one over 2n minus 2. And in my problem, I can assume that the discriminant is bounded by x because I'm trying to count things inside this, uh, or kind of in this function, nn of x. Okay. So in particular, I intended to write this, but we'll sort of add it now. That this n is bounded by x, and one over two n minus two here. Okay. Okay. So we sort of have coefficients that are not too big. Okay. And then the question is, okay, uh, how many sort of polynomials can I write down like this? Well, I also know uh, that every ci is an integer. And so I can just think about how many choices I have for each sort of of these sort of integers. And I know how big there are or how, how big they are. And so it's sort of pretty easy to assemble this uh, into a bound of the number of polynomials. So number of polynomials sort of f alpha is at most a big O of x to sort of the number of choices I can make for c2 times sort of blah, 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 blah. So that's 2 plus 3 plus, plus n over 2n minus 2, which works out to be the Schmidt bound. So in particular, what I've just sort of done uh, is, again, I've sort of said, if I want to count fields, let me sort of pass to some sort of element alpha inside that field. Let me think about how big its minimal polynomial is going to be. If I choose alpha to be kind of one of the smallest integers uh, inside uh, the field that I'm able to construct, then I'm sort of able to say something kind of definitive about the size of its coefficients, and thus kind of bound the number of choices for the minimal polynomial of alpha, and thus also obtain the same bound on the number of fields. And so again, this is in my mind kind of the most natural approach uh, to this problem, uh, given that. I mean, fields are cut out by polynomials. What happens if we just try to see how many polynomials or fields we're able to get when we just kind of keep track of uh, field of polynomials? And so I want to ask a couple of questions and then kind of pause uh, for questions from the audience uh, again. And so the questions I want to ask are kind of some sort of moral questions related uh, to this argument. 
Because in particular, this is a very natural argument kind of for approaching uh, this problem. Okay. Uh, but we get an answer, the sort of x to the n plus two over four, that is very, very far from what we expect the right answer to be, namely sort of big O of x. And so the questions I want to ask are where uh, does sort of this argument lose? Lose. And a seemingly sort of very similar question of why does this argument lose? So of course, these sound like very, very similar questions. But in some sense, what I have in mind here is uh, the first is kind of a more kind of mechanical question. Where kind of in the mechanics of this proof can I see sort of this loss kind of happening, but I'm kind of getting the wrong answer. And the why question in my mind is a little bit more philosophical, which is could I have predicted that this proof would kind of run into some problems? And is there some way of kind of using uh, or approaching this problem a little bit differently? And so the theorems I'm going to be presenting in this talk uh, kind of fit into kind of one of these two sort of, uh, sort of questions or sort of frameworks. Okay? And uh, it turns out sort of the sort of philosophical one sort of is actually a little bit earlier, but I'm going to kind of write it second. And so the first uh, theorem, which is due to myself and seven collaborators, so you'll be sort of have to excuse me if I kind of abbreviate sort of their last names kind of in the future. Uh, but uh, Tess Anderson, uh, Isla Gaffney, Kevin Hughes, myself, uh, David Lowry Duda, Frank Thorne, Jia Wong, and Raishong Zhang. And this is uh, from 2022. This is in fact, posted to the archive on April 1st, I believe, okay, roughly around then, okay, uh, that we're able to eke out a very small improvement uh, over Schmidt. So we start with kind of the Schmidt bound, and then kind of by like uh, grappling with sort of the mechanics of this proof, we're able to improve it uh, by a small amount uh, of this form. Okay. We're going to save one over four n minus four. But as it happens, uh, sort of at the same time we were doing this, uh, kind of an independent team of people uh, were working. Uh, okay, and obtained through similar sort of ideas, I'll kind of discuss kind of the differences uh, in a second. Uh, a similar looking improvement that's sort of saves about twice as much. Uh, so in particular, uh, again, it kind of takes the Schmidt bound as a baseline and then improves this by an amount that's one over two n minus two plus a little bit. So this is kind of my preferred way of writing it, where uh, G is the floor of n minus one over two. Okay. And so we kind of have these two improvements. Okay. And what's sort of worth knowing here, okay, okay. Try this. is that, for example, this latter result uh, implies that n6 of x is big O of x to the 61 over 32 plus epsilon. Okay. And this is our best known bound on degree six fields. Okay. And uh, so it's sort of the improvement here over the Schmidt bound is pretty minimal. I mean, it's sort of this amount that's like either one over four n minus four, or kind of in the best case, a little bit worse than one over two n minus two, okay. right? So even kind of at n six of x, we're kind of improving things by a little less than one tenth. Uh, but what I sort of like about these proofs, and we'll kind of try to convey in a little bit, uh, is that uh, they're really in a sort of kind of serious way, actually kind of like staring the beast in the eyes, right? So there's kind of this sort of big problem and Ultimately, we're going to kind of scamper back to shelter, uh, but we're really trying to like actually kind of confront or sort of uh, kind of take sort of stock of kind of the scope or kind of metal of this problem. And so we're like really trying to sort of like actually kind of get in there. And that's kind of what I'll try to convey in a second. Uh, but 
The second thing I want to say before pausing for questions okay, is a kind of philosophical kind of thing where we kind of tweak the argument, we kind of do something kind of not kind of mechanical, we sort of like re uh, we come up with a different idea. And this sort of uh, kind of dates back to work of Ellenberg and Venkatesh. There was kind of a new idea sort of introduced in their work that uh, was published in uh, 2006. Uh, work of Jean-Marc Pouvenia uh, that was published in 2020 and work of myself and Frank Thorne. It's kind of uh, the state of the art on this, which again could have appeared in the archive in 2020, uh, but will be published in some time, I don't know, maybe this year, but it's not yet been published. And what our theorem is, is that we get kind of an improvement that's kind of rather substantial if we're sort of assumed to be working with very large uh, degrees n. Okay. There's kind of an improvement sort of for large n. Which is a bound of the form nn of x being big O of x to the c times log n squared, where c is some constant uh, that, for example, you could take to be about 1.564. And so what I'll do in sort of the remainder of the talk is kind of go into, again, some of kind of the ideas sort of behind sort of these sort of two theorems. They're kind of related to each other, but kind of, again, sort of at the end of the day, kind of have some differences. And I kind of want to highlight those differences a little bit. Uh, and sort of some of the ideas behind this theorem. But again, I think this is sort of a good point uh, to pause for questions. So are there sort of any from the audience at this stage? If this is too much of a digression, don't worry about Ooh, it. I cannot hear you, Rachel. I apologize. Uh, give me one second. I think if I kind of my computer, can I can you try again? Oh yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, my uh, I'm sort of running sound through my monitor and kind of went to sleep temporarily. Anyway, yes. Um, if, if this is too much of a digression, don't worry about it. But um, is it known how if you know these results for all? and how to put them back together to get a result just for the original conjecture? Yeah, okay, that's a, that's a really, really great question. So more or less what you have to kind of do uh, in uh, sort of these problems is kind of keep track of something that I've, again, kind of been sweeping under the rug, which is that all of these results kind of depend on n. And so you kind of have some implied constant that kind of uh, potentially kind of grows with n. And I'll say here, here kind of the sort of dependence is sort of roughly the form Kind of n to the n. Okay. Uh, it's kind of in Schmidt's work. I think Schmidt doesn't write down kind of the dependence on the degree, but one could kind of extract from his work and like a little bit of clever ideas, some of the dependence like roughly like this. Okay. Here, uh, we're going to get sort of something in the form, I think, roughly n to the uh, maybe I'll say kind of some constant b times n log n. Okay. So we sort of do a little bit worse in the n dependence. Okay. And so you might hope that kind of you can kind of take these things uh, just and kind of add them all up and kind of do reasonably okay. Uh, but it turns out that actually sort of if you try to do that and you try to figure out what this n dependence is for n about say log x, then it actually kind of starts blowing up and you get something uh, that grows uh, much sort of more than polynomially. And so it's kind of like a little bit uh, kind of uncomfortable uh, as far as the situation goes. But that's kind of the best sort of idea we have so far to that. Um, Strictly speaking, some of these results kind of maybe don't care about whether I'm looking at kind of something sort of analogous to an irreducible polynomial versus say like a direct sum. Maybe you don't need to add up, but nevertheless, it's gonna be kind of roughly kind of uh, of that quality. Any other questions? All right. So let's now kind of dig into a little bit where Schmidt's argument kind of lost something. So where uh, did Schmidt's argument lose? Okay. Well, kind of the crux of his proof uh, is to write down these minimal polynomials. Okay. 
sort of the minimal polynomials uh, f alpha of x, x to the n, here are all kind of plus cn, look very different in a way I'm going to sort of make clear in a second uh, from kind of typical polynomials. So what do I mean by that? Well, kind of Schmidt's proof again kind of preceded by saying that these CIs uh, are integers uh, whose size is of the form x to the i over 2n minus 2 for the kind of sort of bound we care about. Okay. And if you were to actually look at the discriminant of a polynomial like this, okay, whose coefficients are roughly of this size, sort of if kind of typically. Uh, such a polynomial would have discriminant disk f being of size about, well, okay, you can kind of think about kind of how these things sort of depend on uh, sort of the coefficients here. Uh, and what you'd sort of get is that typically this should have discriminant about x to the n over 2. All right, so we started with fields discriminant bounded by x, and we ended up with polynomials whose discriminant uh, is bounded by uh, x to the n over 2. Okay. So if n equals 2, then everything's OK. Uh, but uh, if n is bigger than 2, there's kind of a little bit of a gap between sort of the discriminants of the polynomials we're writing down, right, at least sort of typically, uh, and uh, the discriminants of the fields we're trying to count. And so this kind of means that one of two things has to happen uh, for the minimal polynomials that we're actually sort of trying to estimate. Okay. So in particular, uh, this implies sort of that either, I don't know, either does not end in E, either uh, disk F alpha is unusually small So it's going to be much smaller than kind of uh, the discriminant of some polynomial whose coefficients are kind of comparable size to it. Okay. All right. Or and this is going to be actually sort of the more interesting case. Uh, discriminant of f alpha is divisible by a very large square. And why is that? Well, the discriminant of f alpha is kind of the discriminant of the ring z brackets alpha, which is contained in the ring of integers of k. And so it's going to be divisible by the discriminant of OK. But kind of the complementary factor is going to be the index in OK of this ring z alpha squared. So in particular, if I could have imagined that this sort of disk alpha is about x to the n over 2, I'm sort of imagining I'm sort of looking at some polynomial where whose discriminant is not abnormally small. Right? And this is about x. Well, that tells me that this index has to be really pretty big. Okay? In particular, it kind of tells me uh, that uh, sort of there exists some sort of integer m. Uh, of size about x to the, uh, turns out, n minus 2 over 4, such that uh, m squared divides disk f alpha. So again, kind of for the polynomials associated, or the minimal polynomials associated to the elements alpha coming from a field of discriminant bounded by x, they have to look weird in one of two ways. And I'll say, Kind of this one, this first case is comparatively easy to handle. Okay? So I'm not going to kind of worry about it kind of very much uh, right here. Again, if you're sort of interested, I'll have to kind of discuss kind of what goes into this. Uh, but kind of in either paper that it kind of squeaks out a little bit of an improvement uh, to Schmidt's bound, this case is just sort of dispatched with kind of right at the outset, pretty much. And so then the interesting part of the problem uh, is 
kind of in this sort of second thing where we're trying to understand uh, the polynomials that admit a very, very large square factor. And so heuristically, you might expect uh, that uh, M squared divides the discriminant of F alpha kind of sort of with probability about say one over M squared. Okay? Or maybe here I should emphasize say disk F just to indicate that I'm looking at some polynomial. I wanna kind of say that maybe this thing is a candidate kind of minimal polynomial or something. Okay. So kind of naively, this is I think sort of what you should kind of guess in a vacuum. You sort of have some sort of way of constructing some number, You're, whether it's divisible by some other number, you know, probably sort of like probability about kind of uh, inversely proportional to the sort of number you're sort of asking to divide it. Okay, as it turns out, uh, this is wrong uh, if, N in, if M is not square free. But uh, let's sort of naively sort of plow ahead anyway and just kind of see what kind of heuristically we're going to be able to get from something like this. Okay, well, uh, if you sort of make uh, this kind of heuristic assumption. Okay? This sort of says that the proportion, maybe I'll sort of emphasize here that this sort of suggests that the proportion of polynomials uh, whose discriminant is divisible by M squared for some sort of M in this kind of uh, range we came up with sort of uh, earlier and X to the N minus two over four, okay. you might expect that kind of the proportion of polynomials who admits, uh, whose discriminant admits a square factor of this size uh, is big O of kind of one over X to the N minus two over four, okay. right? Roughly corresponding to how many sort of numbers you can write down of this size times kind of the density of this condition. And if you then kind of take this sort of proportion, this kind of heuristic proportion, and multiply it by the total number of polynomials uh, we've constructed, you know, so times sort of total number of polynomials, well, that's the total number of polynomials was exactly the Schmidt bound, which is n plus two over four, you kind of divide by this sort of expected proportion. And lo and behold, sort of the n over four is cancel, and what you get is in fact, big O of X. So in some sense, uh, where the Schmidt bound sort of really loses or the Schmidt argument really loses is in keeping track of kind of these polynomials that admit very, very large square factors. And well, this argument is incredibly sloppy. I mean, it's also kind of wrong in some sense, uh, but uh, kind of heuristically, or it turns out there's a paper uh, that I quite like uh, due to Roel Shankar and Jacob Zimmerman, where they kind of make this sort of into a rigorous heuristic. Heuristic along these lines. Okay. Sort of avoiding kind of any sloppiness sort of in the presentation uh, that I've given above. Okay. And in fact, this actually sort of gives uh, sort of a heuristic sort of asymptotic for degree n SN extensions. Okay. So this heuristic can be kind of made a lot more rigorous if any heuristic can be made rigorous. Uh, but uh, the upshot of kind of this discussion. Uh, is that uh, should try to exploit or could hope to improve Schmidt's argument uh, by sort of uh, accounting for large square factors or square divisors of the discriminant. 
And indeed, this is essentially kind of the tack uh, that these kind of two improvements uh, take. Okay. And so uh, kind of to describe that, I'm gonna kind of not go into kind of particularly technical sort of uh, discussion of kind of exactly what goes into this, but I'll say that there's earlier work of uh, Margava, Shankar, and Wong. And maybe I should sort of emphasize here, this is uh, Jerry Wong. Uh, the kind of from, I guess, 2016 is kind of when it originally appeared, but published in 2022. Uh, it's kind of earlier work that kind of predates sort of uh, either of these improvements I'm discussing. Uh, that kind of develops and sort of exploits like what we might kind of call a sort of strong slash weak dichotomy uh, for uh, square free M uh, with uh, M squared dividing the discriminant of a polynomial. And so kind of roughly speaking, uh, kind of you can kind of think of the strong versus weak as being whether uh, sort of this sort of divisibility can be detected kind of by looking kind of mod P for prime P dividing M or where they need to look at kind of P squared. And so essentially kind of the distinction between kind of these two recent improvements okay, uh, is that uh, in the work uh, in which I was involved with, uh, which again, I'm gonna, Sort of do the uncharitable charitable thing and abbreviate my co-author's uh, last names. Okay? But even then, it still takes up a line, at least with my handwriting. Okay? Uh, sort of essentially, what we do uh, is we find a way to kind of to reduce okay? uh, the general problem uh, of sort of m squared dividing disk f. Uh, to the square free case. So we can then kind of appeal to sort of this existing sort of uh, result. Okay. And I'll say that it's kind of the way we do this is a little bit technical, uh, but kind of one of the fun things of being in a project uh, with so many collaborators is you get kind of a lot of different ideas. And in particular, this paper grew out of an AIM workshop kind of on the interaction between Fourier analysis and arithmetic statistics. What we actually kind of essentially sort of find is that there is a lot of really kind of beautiful structure of the discriminant viewed as a polynomial in the coefficients of the underlying polynomial uh, that's kind of revealed when you take its Fourier transform. It's kind of suitably interpreted. And in many ways, sort of this reduction boils down to kind of understanding that structure and kind of uh, developing it as much as possible. Uh, and then in the sort of uh, improvement, I don't know why I'm sort of putting these in parentheses, but I shall, okay. by Bhargava, Shankar, and Wong to Schmidt. Essentially, uh, they kind of develop a version of the sort of strong sort of weak dichotomy uh, for uh, non-square free M. And this is not something that's like at all straightforward and particularly sort of especially kind of when it comes uh, time sort of when it comes to brass tacks. Uh, so the fact that kind of this uh, sort of one over M squared sort of predicted density is wrong when M is not square free will really kind of take up uh, or really kind of need to be accounted for in your analysis. Okay. Uh, so this is kind of something, but it's, I think something that's going to actually have kind of a lot of consequences uh, in arithmetic statistics uh, kind of going forward. And so essentially, this is sort of what I wanted to say uh, about this kind of mechanical level uh, of improvement uh, to the Schmidt bound. And so uh, let me pause and ask for questions here, but I guess I'll also do the sort of unfortunate thing of asking whether I have 50 minutes or 60 uh, when I hit the 50 minute mark. Um, uh, yeah, sure, feel free to continue. Okay, great. Uh, are there any questions? <laughs> 
not seeing things. So I'll move now into kind of the more, again, kind of philosophical question of why uh, did sort of, or does the Schmidt argument sort of lose? And we sort of already, of course, like saw uh, some hints of this in kind of this previous discussion that okay, these sort of minimal polynomials are really like pretty exceptional uh, amongst sort of polynomials of, with the coefficients of their size. Okay. Uh, but in some sense, we could have predicted that they have to be exceptional okay, because sort of the discriminant, discriminant disk K is really an invariant of sort of the full ring of integers, okay, not of a single uh, alpha in okay. All right, it's so gonna, the Schmidt argument basically sort of says we should uh, look at uh, sort of elements inside sort of our ring of integers. Okay? And that works and okay, it does know everything about the field. I mean, it essentially has to because it kind of will cut out the field. Okay? But at the same time, the discriminant really should be paying attention to the full ring of integers. And that's something that's kind of much more subtle than just one integer can easily detect. And so the idea uh, due to Ellenberg and Venkatesh, okay, and again, this is from a 2006 paper, uh, is exploit multiple sort of integers in OK. And so the way I'm going to kind of present sort of this idea is going to be kind of the uh, approach that Frank uh, and I take to this problem. Okay. But let's just sort of, as an example, uh, consider, say, alpha and beta inside OK. And in particular, uh, I can think of this problem was being about kind of like recovering or can recover uh, K from alpha and beta, right? So Schmidt's proof is in many ways kind of about kind of like finding ways to kind of recover the element alpha. What we're gonna to try to do is we're gonna find uh, ways of kind of recovering the pair of integers alpha and beta, which will then kind of determine the field K. Okay. But notice uh, sort of that in doing this, there's a cost. There's a kind of obvious cost here. We have to recover kind of twice as much information, right? If, if I'm going to be looking at a pair of uh, integers, this is much info. Okay. Then I've kind of doubled sort of the kind of uh, information I need to receive, and so I better have some more efficient way of capturing that information I need to recover uh, this problem, or kind of to recover these pairs. Okay. And so again, what does the Schmidt sort of proof do? Well, the Schmidt sort of approach to recovery uh, would kind of would write down essentially sort of uh, the minimal polynomials f alpha and f beta, okay? or kind of equivalently, we can think of this as writing down uh, sort of kind of the traces of powers of alpha and beta, and just kind of using say like the Newton Girard identities to go from uh, sort of the traces of say alpha squared to sort of the coefficient I've been calling C2. Okay. And I'm gonna write these down in a very suggestive way uh, where we have sort of trace of alpha to the one, okay. trace of alpha squared, up above trace of uh, alpha to the N. And I'll tell you what, maybe I'll even write down an alpha cubed. Okay. And similarly, if I were gonna kind of write down uh, F beta, what I'd be writing down is the trace of beta to the one. And here's where I'm gonna do a little bit of a suggestive sleight of hand, trace of beta cubed, trace, or beta squared, sorry, beta cubed, up, 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 trace of beta to the n. And what I can sort of imagine is if I just sort of took this approach very literally and just tried to write down minimal polynomial of uh, alpha, minimal polynomial of beta, gonna multiply sort of the number of choices for each of those two things, I've done something very, very bad. Right, I sort of have kind of basically kind of uh, squared my bound. I kind of have uh, not kind of recovered this cost at all. Okay. But I also haven't exploited the fact that alpha and beta live inside the same field. 
And so in particular, kind of the key sort of uh, thing to be leveraged here is that I can write down lots of other traces as well. I could write down the trace of alpha beta. I could write down the trace of alpha squared beta, trace of alpha beta squared, sort of, et cetera. So in particular, I have many, many more. Uh, there are sort of many more, many more sort of mixed traces, trace sort of alpha to the i, beta to the j to exploit. And the key sort of uh, advantage here is that sort of if, uh, let's say alpha and beta are Schmidt size, so big O of x to the one over two n minus two, then uh, this trace is an integer, then trace alpha to the i, beta to the j, uh, will be something of size x to the i plus j over two n minus two. And so indeed, what I kind of want to be paying attention to is the size of this thing kind of basically relative to, kind of to the layer of sort of this kind of table I've drawn. I want to be kind of paying attention to sort of uh, the total degree of kind of this trace. And the fact that I have many more sort of mixed traces should give me some hope. And in particular, uh, you should kind of should think, should hope that if Kind of two n sort of mixed traces uh, are specified. Say trace alpha to the i beta to the j being equal to some say t i j. Uh, then uh, you can recover. Uh, sort of alpha and beta uh, by solving uh, the equations, sort of trace alpha to the i beta to the j equals t i j for kind of the n variables, or sort of uh, what I'm going to think of as n variables for the n conjugates of alpha and the n conjugates of beta. Okay. So in particular, I kind of think of these sort of n conjugates or these n embeddings okay. as variables, kind of naively, if I write down kind of two n of these sort of mixed traces or I kind of tell you what two n of them are, I should kind of think I've got two n equations, two n unknowns, I should be able to kind of to solve for these things. Okay. Uh, but of course, algebraic geometry is not easy something I say quite often as an analytic number theorist. Okay? Uh, and uh, so you need to kind of do a little bit more work uh, kind of to actually justify it. Okay? And in particular, what Frank and I show, I'll call this sort of a lemma, but uh, is that kind of the 2n mixed traces with smallest i plus j uh, are algebraically independent. So in particular, if these sort of mixed traces are algebraically independent, then you're kind of guaranteed that this kind of like naive sort of numerology of two n equations, two n variables uh, will kind of work uh, to give you, uh, to let you kind of like determine sort of these n embeddings of each of these sort of integers alpha and beta, and hence the field. And so then the key point is that it sort of implies as a corollary almost, or well, I guess this implies a bound sort of that nn of x is big O of x to the eight thirds times the square root of n. Okay. So in particular, we've kind of, kind of increased the cost. So sort of we have to kind of solve for kind of two things. We have kind of have two integers we're trying to find, but we've sort of had the net effect of kind of reducing the exponent uh, from kind of an n to an n to the one half. Okay. And then essentially the magic of uh, sort of the idea or sort of the magic or sort of of sort of the Ellenberg-Mankatesh idea, idea 
is that there's no reason to stop at two integers. At two integers, alpha, beta, why not look at, say, R many? Right, so why not kind of look at, say, an R tuple of algebraic integers? And I'll kind of hide some of the details here, but then I'll kind of say that kind of the key sort of difficulty in kind of approaching this problem this way is establishing sort of algebraic independence. And in particular, uh, we sort of appeal to a kind of fairly big hammer called the Alexander Hershowitz theorem uh, that kind of lets us then kind of, kind of assert that sufficiently many of these sort of mixed traces are algebraically independent, that this sort of kind of strategy, and I've generalized fairly straightforwardly from what I've presented above, uh, will work. And this is kind of what leads to uh, sort of the bound I sort of mentioned earlier, an n of x being big O x to the c sort of log n squared, sort of basically by taking r to be about uh, log n. And so I think I've gone a little bit over, so I should sort of, I think, end sort of the official portion of my talk. Uh, but of course, I also very much want to ask for questions and be glad to stick around for however long I have to talk farther about this.